Kelly. It's great. Thank you. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 27, we read, So God created humankind in the image, in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Let's say it again. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. These are really profound words, and it speaks to a couple of things. One is that being made in the image and likeness of God, that it means that we have that divine presence, that God seed, the Christ spirit, whatever you want to call it, that dwells within each one of us. That is why we are here, is to fully express that. The other profound profoundness, if you will, about that statement is that if we are created in the image and likeness of God, so too do we create our own world in our own image and likeness. Do we not? If ever we doubt this, have you noticed that uh, there's life patterns or life lessons that you have that keep repeating themselves for you? Yeah? Or you move and you find yourself kind of surrounded with the same people. Or you get a new job and it's the same people. And it's like, why is that? Why is that? It's because we're taking ourselves there. And we are creating the world, our world that we're living in, in our own image and likeness through our imaginations. So we're co-creators in this universe. And my question to you this morning is, what are you creating co-creating in your life, and what are we collectively co-creating in our planet, in the world? Johnny Coleman is a New Thought minister who recently died in her 90s, an African-American woman and a great uh, bright light in the New Thought movement in unity. And um, this is what she said about the imagination. And if you don't like the way things are going in your life, she said, then change the image. If you don't like what you're doing, change the image. Imagination is an attribute of God. It is the formative power of thought, and it gives shape, tone, and coloring to thinking. It's what makes it alive. It what makes it, it, it what it's what makes our dreams alive. It's what makes our thoughts, you know, have texture and form to them. Stephen Covey, who wrote the Seven uh, Habits of Successful People, his second um, his second uh, rule, if you will, is to use the imagination. That the imagination is like is like a blueprint that we use to uh, bring the world into manifestation, to bring our dreams into manifestation. And what he said is that if we don't take an active part in imagining our lives, then what happens is we sort of live by default. He said it this way. He said, if you don't make a conscious effort to visualize what you want and who you are in life, then you empower other people and circumstances to shape you and your life by default. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? So, there, so we've been given this gift by God to do something with and to um, otherwise, you know, by default, it's like, well, whatever, whatever happens, happens. Whatever we imagine just happens to be. So here's how the imagination plays out in our life. And I want to share a story that Jay sent me this week. And I'm sure you all know Jay, but Jay, just stand up for a minute so everybody knows who you are if they don't know who you are. So Jay said that um, after high school, he didn't have any money for college and he wanted to play baseball in the worst way. So he ended up joining the Navy, and he found out that the Navy had a baseball team. Now, before he left to join the Navy, he said he started picturing himself in the batter's box and hitting every pitch out of the park in his imagination. He said he could hear his teammates congratulating him. He could feel the high fives and the handshakes. And he said he did this every night before leaving for San Diego where he was stationed. So at boot camp, after boot camp, the majority of uh, his unit went abroad immediately, aboard ships. It's the Navy, right? You go aboard ships. 
but he was given shore duty for three years. And guess what he did? He played baseball for three years on a very good baseball team. He said he batted cleanup even though he only weighed 125 pounds. So he said he continued to use his imagination when he played golf, and now when he paints, he'll see it in his mind before he paints the picture. So this is a great example of how we use our imagination in our lives. And I know that for Jay's example, you can come up with a hundred more, right? I mean, we have all done this. We have all visualized. We're New Thought students. We're Unity students. We have all used our imaginations. Gene Houston has said that... Um, that we have not only a physical body, but we have a kinesthetic body. And that we can send our kinesthetic body before us. You know, if you have a job interview or if you have something that you have to do, you can send it before you and you can visualize and experience what's happening um, before it happens and sort of clear the way. Not only clear the way, but draw to you good things, I think. So... An example that was coming to me, I've had a couple, and I, again, I'm sure you have like a hundred of your own, but when I was uh, pregnant with, my, with Jordan, my first child, I was having a home birth, and you know, I was a little bit nervous, as all new mothers are. It's like, you know, you want to do it right, you don't want to end, you know, you want everything to go well. So I had this book, and the book uh, uh, was a guided meditation that walked you through the stages of labor. So what I ended up doing was, recording this visualization, and I played it for myself every night before I went to bed, you know, even a couple of times. I played it over and over, and it must have been for a month that I listened to this, this tape about the, the stages of labor. So what ended up happening is that when I did go into labor, I went into labor at three in the morning, and I, I, it's almost as if my body was like, okay, got it, down. We're going to run through the stages. And Jordan was born in an hour and a half. Whoa. It's like, wham. It's like I started in stage three. And um, I remember my birth team was trying to get things set up, and so I was alone with the cat. And I was walking around, and, and, and then I'd hit the floor, and the cat would put his forehead right to my forehead, and we'd go, rah! And then I'd get up and walk, and the cat would ricochet off the walls, and then I'd hit the floor again, and the cat would... <laughs> but I always wondered later, because, you know, my daughter, my second child wasn't born that fast. You know, I wasn't doing any visualizations with her. I was letting it go, letting it be. <laughs> but when we use our imaginations, when we use our visualizations in... Um, different situations, I think it does a lot to clear the way. So I know I've shared this story, and I share it a lot in my prayer class, but it really speaks to this whole idea of what is the purpose of using one's imagination? What is the purpose of using one's kinesthetic body? In fact, you know, why not actually act out that which you are seeking to bring more of into your life? Why not put yourself fully into it and play? Isn't that what kids do all the time? They're always playing. Didn't Jesus say, unless you become as a, a little child, you will not enter the kingdom? of God? What is the kingdom of God? It's the expansion of consciousness. It's the use of the imagination. So when I was in ministerial school, um, it's a two, it was a two-year program, and you had four oral exams. <clears throat> one, the last one, was literally three or four days before our ordination ceremony. And I was doing well. I was doing pretty well. And then in January, which was the third interview, a new person got on my team that interviewed me, and she didn't like me. And, and uh, it, 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 so anyway, during the interview, I totally blew it. I mean, I, just, I couldn't even answer a question like, what is the Christ, right? I was like, totally messed up. So I was put on what is called a concerned list. And the concerned <laughs> list means you may or may not get ordained in June, but you won't know that until two days before. So there's a lot of pressure on this one interview, and I was so praying and hoping this woman, you know, something would, she'd get a vacation or something, and she wouldn't show up and be, because my team was fine till she got on it. So, and your family is all coming in for the ordination ceremony, and since you don't know whether you're ordained until three days before, you can't cancel anything. It's a big deal. So um, I lived... 
on the grounds at Unity Village. I lived in an apartment. And right behind me was an old amphitheater that had been built like in the 30s because the Fillmores would have band concerts and they would hold services out there. It's now been torn down. And it was crumbling then, but it still had the walls and it still had the stage and the stairs. And, you know, it was still, it was an outdoor amphitheater. So since I lived behind, you know, right next to it, the night before the interview, I, I stood at the bottom of the stairs and I pretended that I was getting ordained. And so I stood at the bottom of the stairs and I heard my name and then I walked across the stage, I took my diploma, shook hands with the president of the association and then walked down, yay, I'm ordained. And then I did it again and again and again and I must have done it about 10 times where I ordained myself in this amphitheater. So basically it's using the imagination, the kinesthetic and the physical body and moving it forward. So the next day, for the interview, I walked in, and here's this woman, and she's got her guns loaded. She's ready. And she starts off with a question about why is there evil in the world? Well, the thing is, I had that down, because at that time, I wanted to be a police chaplain. That's where I thought my ministry was going. And so I shared that. I answered the question, and then I shared that. Well, what I didn't know is, she was a police chaplain. It was her side, in, to, in addition to her ministry, that is what she did. And she lit up like a Christmas tree and she said, police chaplaincy, let me tell you all about police chaplaincy. And there was 10 minutes of my interview taken up with police chaplaincy and I knew I was ordained in that moment. <laughs> and I was. <clears throat> And so it's the use of the imagination, right, that, that pulls us in these situations. And, and the imagination is extremely powerful. And I think that we can dilute it sometimes when we, you know, if we get lost in other people's stories, like through movies and television. Believe me, I love movies. I love them. But I wonder how much time I spend and we spend in watching other stories. And so we're not really creating our own stories. When I was at that 10-day Vipassana retreat, I told you, you know, there was nothing to do. You had to sit there and watch your breath. And then when I was in my room at night, it's like, I'm not tired. It's 9.30. I've just been sitting and watching my nose all day and my breath, you know. And so... What I noticed was my imagination was so vivid that it was like three-dimensional. I was, I was experiencing these incredible things because it was like there was no outer entertainment, right? It was coming from me. I remember when my children were little, when they were like, you know, five, six years old, and I went to a parent meeting. And what the teacher said was something that has stayed with me. She said, now your kids are five or six, they're in first grade, kindergarten, whatever, for the first time in their lives, they're now going to be bored because they've never been bored up to this point. They just play one game after another, one scenario after another. And she said, your kids are going to come to you and they're going to say, I'm bored. And what you're going to want to do is save them. You're going to want to fill it in. You're going to want to entertain them. You're going to want to fix it. And she said, whatever you do, do not fix it. Leave it and let them figure it out themselves because that's when the imagination will kick in. And boy, I, sh I remember soon after that, my, one of my kids came to me and said, I'm bored. And I said, well, good for you. That means your imagination's gonna kick in any second. You're so lucky. <laughs> in our Foundations of Unity class, we have been studying a heartfelt uh, metaphysics by Paul Hasselbeck and he talks about the different stages of consciousness because we create our world in our own image we create our world through our consciousness yeah and so what he says is that there's four stages of consciousness and we probably move back and forth between them all the time and the first is the victim consciousness and this is maybe before we get on a spiritual path and we think everything is happening to us it's like oh my god everything's happening to me and when we create that when we have that victim consciousness, then we tend to create it no matter what the situation or the place, right? 
The second stage is called victor consciousness, which is I'm going to use my imagination and I'm going to direct my life. What Jay did in manifesting baseball in the Navy was a form of victor consciousness, right? What I did with the ordination scenario is a form of victor consciousness. And we all, again, have it. The third is vessel consciousness. So we move, we move beyond that, and it's like, okay, now I'm an instrument of God. I'm an instrument of peace. Use my voice, use my body, and speak through me. And then finally, the fourth is verity consciousness. And verity is standing in, I am the presence of God. You are God. And we, we live and move and have our being from that place. Now, in real life, we probably jump back and forth between all the different ones. I think when I look at the labor situation, that's vessel. What else are you when you're giving labor, but in, when you're in labor and giving birth, but vessel? So, <clears throat> so it's good to know what state of consciousness we're in when we are imagining. And the truth is that sometimes we have leaders who inspire us and trigger our imagination so that we collectively believe and we can see a dream and a new existence being brought into the world. JFK did it when he said in the early 60s that by the end of the decade, we're going to go to the moon. I mean, really, we didn't have the technology. We didn't know how we were going to do it. But he spoke those words. He said, it's like we threw our hat over the fence and now we have to go get it. You know, because we spoke those words and we saw it. And he's speaking from victor consciousness, but I think there was a level where he was also speaking from verity consciousness. When we speak from verity consciousness and we live from verity consciousness, then we're calling that verity out of, out of others as well. And he called it out of this nation so that we were able to put a man on the moon by 1969. Now the truth is, more than anyone, Martin Luther King spoke from verity consciousness, and he called us to dream collectively. And, you know, it's probably the most quoted speech in the world, but hear it. I want, I'm going to read part of it, and I want you to hear it from verity consciousness, from, from the God self. And as he's, as he's speaking these words, he is, he is calling the verity, the God out of each one of us. He said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at a table in brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heart of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I have a dream that one day right here in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. Can you hear the verity? Can you hear that that is where he was speaking from, that he was speaking from a higher, a higher plane. He was speaking from his God self. And in speaking from his God self, he called out the God self in all of us. He called out the God self in our nation. Now it's taken time for it to begin to, to manifest, but he spoke those words. He dreamed and he used that imagination. So we are in the midst of some big challenges. As we all know, climate change is up, right? It's like the east is getting buried in snow, and here we are. It's like, what are we, in northern California? I mean, the, the flowers are blooming, and there's no snow up on the mountains, and it's like, okay, things are shifting and changing here. And so as we look at those experiences that are happening, what can we do in, in, with the use of this gift of imagination that we've been given? How can we 
begin to shift and change things. So I just would like, I know we're, we're, we're almost out of time, but I want to just take a moment just to stop and to just bless this planet because we're here collectively and we're here in community and we're, we're, we're all powerful dreamers and imaginers together. So just take a moment, if you will. And in using your imagination, if you would see our planet in your mind's eye. And whatever healing image that you have, surround it now with, surround the planet now with that image, whether it be light, whether it be energy. And we could visualize snow on the mountains or you know, lesser temperatures in the east, but really what we're needing to manifest is divine order. The planet knows how to heal itself. So we give our energy, our supportive energy, and hold that divine order, that right sequence in the seasons in all the creatures that live on this planet. And I invite you to feel the beat of your heart for a moment. And imagine your heart connecting with the heart of the person sitting next to you. And behind you and in front of you. And may our hearts be connected with all hearts on this planet, that we awaken together and take right action. I stand in verity consciousness and I call for all of us to awaken to the di divinity that we are and to this blessed and sacred place on which we live. May we treat it kindly, gently. And may it be healed. Amen. It was an experiment that was done years ago with prayer healing, and um, it was called the Spindrift Group, and they found that uh, people who were prayed for in the hospital, it didn't matter what form of prayer, whether it was affirmative or Catholic or whatever, that they healed faster. But then they also did an experiment where they had seeds and planted them and they said, you know, most of the time we're prayed for when we're stressed out, so let's stress the seeds. Let's put some bleach in the, in the, in the uh, soil. So then they uh, put, a, put a line between the two and prayed for both sides. And one side, they visualized the seeds growing, flourishing wonderfully. And the other, they just went divine will, divine order. So which side do you think grew better, more, faster? Divine will. So that's why I say we could visualize snow on the mountains. That would be great, but maybe we'll... So let's affirm divine will and divine order manifesting. So Stephen Covey said that if we are not an active participant in our imagination and a co-creation of our world, then we, we, we end up being who we are or uh, experiencing circumstances by, by default. Johnny Coleman said that Change the image if you don't like what you're doing. Imagination is an attribute of God. It is the formative power of thought, and it gives shape, tone, and coloring to thinking. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So just as you and I have been, been created in the image and likeness of God, so too do we create our own world. So let us co-create a world that works for all.
Blessings to you.